Hey everybody, this is the Upstaging Gentleman Podcast. Thank you for listening. This is Michael with Play With Your Food Productions. And Nathan Prince, Legendary Productions. What's up? And we got a very special guest with us in here today. Nathan, you want to do the honors and yeah. introduce him? Super excited. Um, not only, we said Dustin already, but... Dustin Sidehammer? No, we didn't say Dustin. We said Dustin on the slate. Oh, that's true. We said nobody Dustin nobody right heard the slating up. We just yeah. gave it away. It's we Dustin just gave it Sidehammer. Away. <laughs> Dustin Surprise! Sidehammer is here. Hey, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction and bio, and then we'll get started. Uh, Dustin is off the charts one of the most talented people that we know, Wait, for is sure. That, is that in his bio? I he wrote is, that. Oh, you wrote that? Yeah, I totally okay. wrote that bio. <laughs> that part of the bio. I was like, it's not true, but I mean, I mean it is true, but that was like, whoa, that's slightly arrogant, but you know, it's his bio. No, he really is the most talented. He the probably most talented is really. the most. Andy's the most tall, the tallest. Person? I think I go like belly button, like height to you. I think he might be the tallest person I know, actually. How tall are you, Dustin? Six eight. That's yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> God given. All right, he has been involved in performing and arts his entire life. Um, if I were to list out all the things that he's capable of or he's done, it would take our entire podcast. So let's get to the good stuff and meet this talented guy. Um, I just want to say a side note. I've known Dustin for like 20 years. He has helped me out 20, 25 years, 27 years, 25 years. Sorry, he gave me the 25 years, over 20 years. And um, he's helped me out with so much and all the stuff that we've talked about in our previous podcast, inspired, educated, taught, teamed up on, really, really talented. So Dustin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having I'm me. Glad you're here, right. man. So I, I think I have known you. We have another star in the, the room today. John Kaminiak? Yeah. yeah he's, our, he's the guy busting our sound. You've heard him on other podcasts of ours. Check his book out. You might uh, hear him giggling in the back. Yes, it's, called, it's called Gumdrops. Really good. Um, anyway, go ahead, yes. Mike. I was say, so I've, I've known you, Dustin, I think for 20, 22 years now. And I've out of all those years, I've only seen you lose your patience one time. Only once? <laughs> only one time. I would have guessed at least twice. No, one, one was time. Was it the go get your scripts? Yeah. Get your scripts. Go get, get your, your scripts. scripts. <laughs> You lose your temper one moment. time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so everybody else is listening to us uh, just reminisce about it. So, um, but we're having a good time here. So Dustin, though, um, just had, you know, one of the greatest, uh, well, I'm assuming, I'm going to speak this for you, but it must have been one of the, the greatest times of your life here or one of the, the, the most well-known projects in the series Obi-Wan. And uh you want to tell us a little bit about your character in Obi-Wan? Sure, yeah. So it's uh, on Disney+. Plus. It was the uh, in the Star Wars universe. Yes. The character Obi-Wan Kenobi got a breakout series. It initially was going to be three feature films. And then Disney+, Plus decided that they wanted to have a, a new series. And so they scratched the idea of making three films and made it a six um, limited series, six episodes limited series. And... In this series, um, they wanted to have a charm character, and they developed um, Doug Ching. Developed, um, he designs a lot of the different characters for Star Wars, and he's um, the, actually the vice president of Lucas, um, the Lucas Corporation. And he designed and developed a character called Ned B, a lovable droid. And they were looking for a while to find the body that would fit inside this <laughs> this costume. Um, they knew they wanted it to be tall, uh, walk on two feet, um, but other than that, they didn't have quite a vision for it. Um, and so they did some design, and eventually they found me, and they actually built the costume around me and my proportions. So okay. anytime that Ned B will be seen here on out in like history, it will be because my knees are where my knees are and my shoulders are my shoulders. What was the process of getting that? Did you have to go like to tryouts, auditions? Like how'd you, how'd that go about? Yeah. yeah so I, um, it, it, it was during the pandemic. Uh, I was in New York at the time. They're, they're based out in California. And so they, we had a series of auditions where they needed me to send um, agility tests of like different things I can do and other work that I've done. So they could just kind of see my body type, my movement type. Um, so I sent that in and I didn't hear anything for about three months. And so I just figured, oh, I didn't get it, blah, 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 blah. And then um, that was in, I think, November. And then four months later in March, I get like kind of a frantic phone call saying like, what is your schedule for the next three months? You know, like, are you available? And I'm in New York doing nothing because it's the pandemic. And I was like, I'm completely 
completely available for anything, you, like anything you need. And so they said, hey, can you resend your stuff? So I resent my audition videos and all of that. And um, that was on a Tuesday. And on Wednesday, they, they messaged me and said, hey, do you have anything showing um, where the, the design team is worried you're not going to be strong enough to carry the costume? Um, cause it's a heavy physical, practical suit. So no CGI, it was all going to be physical. And they're like, we're just, they're, they're worried that you're too thin. And so I, I went to the gym and I did like squats, like weighted squats. I did push pull-ups, um, push-ups. I did all this calisthenics just to show that I could like carry weight and stuff. So, um, that was on a Wednesday. I sent that video in. And then on Thursday, I got a phone call saying, welcome to the Star Wars family. Awesome. So it, it, I ended up getting the role because of like a pull-up competition. <laughs> okay, but, but in hindsight, we worked out at the gym many times. You're not weak. You're wicked strong. So it's kind of funny they thought that because I'm not yeah. going to admit that you've outlived me on some No, things. no, no. That's not true. Your, you have. <laughs> your okay. sister. Not the way. Not the way. Okay, that's true. <laughs> Nate's sister, Amy, who I absolutely love. Um, beat me at an arm wrestling competition, and I think she could still do it. So okay, that's that's true. <laughs> but endurance, I could probably lift more weight, but you could definitely last longer. I am long suffering. I am long suffering. So you, so you had to video yourself doing all this exercise and show what you could lift. Mm -hmm. And sent that in. Was there a? Did they say okay? You got to be able to lift this much or? I think they, not necessarily, they didn't put like a, a mark on it, like you have to be able to lift so many pounds, but I think they just wanted, it's um, creature work um, is what it's kind of classified when you wear like a suit or a suit performer creature work. Um, it's really strenuous. Um, you can be in these costumes for hours and hours at a time. Um, you can't be claustrophobic. Um, you can't be real precious when it comes to like food and bathroom breaks, water, because um, a lot of time you don't have access to your underwear, <laughs> you know, you don't have access to like a, a feeding tube. Um, so you, it, it really takes a, it's, it's, it's a weird art form. Well, how long did it take to get the costume on? Uh, it was about 45 minutes. And you got, you got a, like a crew of people helping you? Yeah. Uh, two wonderful ladies uh, who actually helped uh, build the costume. They were on set every day. I ended up being on set for three months. So it, we shot very slow. Uh, my character was uh, only in 11 pages of the script. Um, but we shot those 11 pages for three months. We were moving like at a snail pace. The um, director, Deborah Chow, is very, very detail oriented. And so every everything has to be perfect in the Star Wars universe, you know, it, from their opinions. Yeah. I, I remember watching the series and knowing that you were in it. And, you know, just watching with my kids. I was like, hey, my friend Dustin is in this. Network. Which one is he? And, and I'm looking around for you. And I'm like, I don't know which one he is. I, but we're keeping close watch on the screen. And finally, this ginormous robot appears. And I'm, huh, droid. The droid. Probably that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it takes, uh, so it, when we started the process, it took about 45 minutes. And then it would take 20 to get out of it. So in order to get a bathroom break, you would have to have at least an hour. So that's a big ask on a film set, you know, when, you know, time is money. Be like, I have to go to the bathroom, so you're not going to see me for an hour. So it definitely, you have to really plan when you drink water, when you go to the bathroom, when you eat. Um, there's, it's, it's a hard process. What was the longest time you were in a suit at one time? I mean, probably about 12 hours, uh -huh. um, maybe, so, maybe longer but there was the, the hardest days where they, you know, they, you get there and they're like, okay, we need you in the suit right away, blah, blah, blah. They put you in and then you're in it for about four hours and they still haven't used you. And you're like, um, are, are they going to get to it? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. They're going to get to it. And then it's, it's lunchtime, but they only give you like maybe 45 minutes for lunch and that's not enough time to get out and in my costume. So we'd have to like stay in it even though we knew we weren't shooting. Anyhow, it, it just, it was a... Didn't that go against some union regulation somewhere? Probably. <laughs> probably. But you, but you sucked it up for the team. Yeah, I mean, in, in those situations, guy. you definitely, like, you get some meal penalties, you know, like some extra bonuses, but you really, you just, it's Star Wars, and so you want to do a great job, and you just kind of want to go with the flow and be a good friend and try not to ruffle feathers, but there were times that it was harder to do that than others. Yeah. That is, that's super... Um, so then what was it like this, this, this great character you developed, Ned B and he's, you know, he's saves 
has his part in like you know saving Princess Leia and everything, and then and then dies. What is it? What is it like he, to have your character killed off? It um. Ned B, when I read the pages, um, it's so sweet. He just has a hero's heart. You know, he's a, a, a droid, but there's a part of him that just wants to do good. And I love that about him, that he he just has a hero's heart. And when, he, when the rubber meets the road, he's going to be the one to stand in front of the bullet for a friend. And that was like a really cool, um, you know, just get to <laughs> try to communicate some of that behind you know, inside this giant costume. I felt that the moment he appeared on stage, I was like, that droid has got the heart of a hero mm. right there. Do you feel that? Didn't watch it. I just watched <laughs> Dustin's scenes. You just watched Dustin's scenes. Yeah. But well, you know, I, there were some actually, of the best scenes in the show. This has nothing to do with Dustin. I've never seen any Star Wars productions ever. I've never watched any Star Wars. Hopefully we don't lose any listeners from this, but um, just never really watched that. But all Dustin stuff, I definitely watched... A highlight reel. Um, there's on YouTube. You can check it out. There's actually highlight reel. So I've checked well, that out. Support. I was I was about to say uh, we won't lose listeners because I've watched the show. But then I realized I, I slipped up and said robot droid. <laughs> it was a droid. It was a I, slip. Didn't, I, I apologize. Didn't even say that. I didn't even say robot. That's good. All right, but you know what? Like you know what? Like for you, there was C three PO, R two D two, and then like you, you know you made droids sexy again. Oh, that's thank what you, you did. With the heart of a hero. Um, yeah, a hero heart, for sure. And so we got a question from a listener. So oh, yeah. what does it feel like now to have your own action figure? That's so cool. <laughs> the, um, I Going into it, you know, you don't know how they're going to merchandise things and franchise things. Um, but you kind of hope. You're like, if my character is memorable enough. You know, and I, I remember reading the pages and thinking, well, I guess I, mean, I save Obi-Wan's life twice. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> in the episodes I'm in, there's like, I save his life twice. I'm like, I think that, I mean, that that's worthy of a lunchbox. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, that's worthy of an action figure or something. So I really hope that I was going to get, um, that Ned B was going to be like commercialized that way. But he's on t-shirts and... I also got a sticker. Let's talk about supporting a sticker up there of his character. In the office, in our studio. Yes, so, you do. I want a sticker. Nope. <laughs> oh. <laughs> one of the one of the coolest things, and it hasn't uh, it hasn't happened yet. You guys are actually the first. Uh, I'm talking about this publicly for the first time on your guys' show. Yeah. Um, but I got a um, last fall. I was approached by Topps um, baseball cards or the trading mm -hmm. card company um, to sign fifteen thousand Ned B cards. Um, so that I did. <laughs> That's uh, how long did that take? I, uh, it took a l longer than I thought it was going to. I was like, oh, I'll be able to bust it out real quick. It, it took hours and hours and hours. You, you should have videotaped that. That's the endurance test you send. <laughs> Not look at me at the gym. Here's me signing 15,000 cards. Yeah, I, it, it was a lot. I, I was working um, on another film set. And so I would bring my signature cards. So, so while I wasn't being used, I would just be signing the cards and, so I was getting like double pay. <laughs> so, so I used to collect baseball <laughs> cards. That's pretty awesome that there's a collecting card. And it's your signature on there. Same. Yeah. That's I, awesome. I used to collect, you know, like in grade school, I had all the baseball cards and comic cards. And That's sick. Uh, yeah, so the official tops trading card, um, there's, uh, there, I think there's four different cards um, that you can kind of collect to have all of the different Star Wars cards. Do but you know when they release or is that confidential still? Um, I saw... Some of them on eBay already, but I haven't seen the final product of the cards yet. Mm, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. All right. So walk us through here. Your your first day coming on to set for the actual the actual filming. What's what's that like on day one? Oh my goodness. So it was um, my very first day. I had done several movement tests and some screen tests already with the costume because I wanted to make sure there were no problems with the mobility wanted to make sure that it got approved by the director and producer so they could sign off. Um, so I had probably like three or four screen tests, movement tests, um, costume fittings, things like that. Uh, for about two months, I would go in about once a week and they would adjust the costume, make sure it fit, make sure everything was like going well. But then the first day for the actual filming, it was on location. We were in the desert and they were doing some helicopter shoots and, um, so Ned B is, Ned B is a specific droid, part of an uh, army of robots that look exactly like him. So there's hundreds of Ned robots, robot droid characters, um, but there's only one Ned B. And what makes Ned B 
Ned B is that he has a blue collar and he has a blue arm, um, but everyone else is completely yellow. So my very first scene I shot was just a generic Ned. Um, so it, it's basically the same costume, but just different colors. And so I, I was on set and I got to meet the director. I'm, so I'm meeting this crew. Um, there's probably about 250 people on location. Um, just it's insane the amount of support team they have. You know, every department is fully stacked and loaded. And I just, I, you know, my heart is beating, you know, like, oh my goodness, this is really happening. And it, when you're walking around Disneyland and you're in like a, a land, you're like, you're in front of your land or, you know, it just feels very encompassing. And that's how it felt when I walked on set. Like you felt like you were at like a land at Disneyland because every detail, all the facades of the, the structures, you know, you just feel like you're in another universe. And it was, it was wild just to, to walk. And so we, we did our blocking. So I met the director for the very first time in person and she talked me through the beats of the scene. And then the man who owns, um, I always want to say legendary, but it's legacy. Um, he he's like, okay, we're gonna gonna do your blocking, and then we're gonna go get you in your costume, and then I know it's gonna be inconvenient, but I want you to walk to set so everyone, like the like every person in the crew, can see the in full costume for the very first time. So it's, he, he was really like, I want a big reveal. We've worked so hard on building this costume. It's the first time people are going to see it. I don't want them to see you with your head off or your arms off. Like I want the complete costume. He's like, it's going to be hell. You're going to be in it for a long time. You're going to have to walk real far, but I want them to have this first exposure of mm -hmm. seeing Ned B. Um, cause everyone was really excited to, you know, they'd heard rumors about it. They'd maybe seen pictures. Uh, maybe some people had seen some of the movement tests, but they had never seen it in person. And so we went back to like, um, they had a, a U-Haul truck, which was so nice with air condition in it. You know, we were in the desert. I felt so spoiled. Everyone else was like sweating and here, like they put Ned B in a, a really nice U-Haul with like an air condition in the back. So that was, that was very, very kind of them. So I get all dressed and then walk to set. And as I'm walking, you just hear the, everyone is like, Nebby! they're so excited. Um, they, they would call me Bumblebee. Um, <laughs> a lot of the, the set guys and, and they're like, Bumblebee's on set today. And it was really fun. But, um, just seeing the crew's reaction to Ned was so cool. Um, you know, they had been working really hard for about, I think they'd been filming for at least six weeks before they started filming my stuff. Um, and so it was kind of a, I think they were all excited for something new to see something kind of exciting. And so it was fun to be a part of that. So equally as, you know, like it's, it's cool. Like you get to be a part of this, you know, this, the star Wars legacy. I mean, you know, it spans so many decades and will likely as Disney comes up with spinoffs, just keep going into the future here. And it's got to be so cool to be a part of that. And yet, is it intimidating also to be a part of that, knowing like, oh my goodness, like I got to join the ranks of, you know, all these other people that are in, you know, even, you know, Harrison Ford, I'm, I'm, I'm in the club now and, and, um, and people are going to be watching me like Star Wars fans and everybody. And it's like, what is that like? The fandom is the coolest. They, the people who love Star Wars love Star Wars and yeah. it's so cool. Um, I got to go to, it's called um, Celebration. It's once a year, Star Wars has a big convention and I got to go to that and just feel, um, my episode hadn't aired yet, Obi-Wan hadn't aired yet. So I just got to go as a, like a fan mm -hmm. and to feel the amount of energy and love, like it gave me a newfound respect for how how sacred really this is to so many people. And it, it spans three generations. You have the people who saw it in the seventies and now they have kids and those kids have kids. Um, so it's a multi-generational like love for this franchise. And really, I mean, I, I feel very humbled and honored that I have even like a small part of the legacy, it, but it's, it's amazing. You know, I, I have an appearance manager now, which sounds so weird to say, um, but uh, he also is like Harrison Ford's appearance manager. So, you know, and uh, when Carrie Fisher was alive, she was part of the, the same management team. Um, and it just, I'm, it, I just scratched my head. Like, how did I get here? This is so bizarre. I mean, I, I, I'm so honored and it just, it feels it feels too big. 
you know, it just feels too big. Like being at the convention and seeing the thousands and thousands of people who just love this, love this story so much. And how long are you now under this appearance manager? I mean, just like, well, I played dead B, so I'm, I'm this guy's for as long as they're in business or like, or is there a contract with them? Or are you just Ned B for life and, and under this franchise and agreement now? Yeah. So there are, um, there are different like appearance managers. Um, but my personal one signed me for a year and then you can kind of renegotiate after the year. Like, do we have a good working relationship? Is this good? But my guy has been in the business for 30 years and, you know, he has some of the biggest names in the star wars franchise so i trusted him to you know make good deals and it's like if harrison ford trusts him who am i to say i think i could do better without you <laughs> so uh was uh ewan mcgregor he pretty intimidated to work with you i imagine oh of course <laughs> <laughs> no what was that like oh man he he was a uh, um then like truly one of the kindest he's as cool and as down to earth as you would hope a celebrity to be like he, there's no ego there, like none. It's really interesting. It like starts from the top and it's like, if Ewan walks in and something isn't right and he's not complaining about it, you're not going to complain about it, you know, cause it's, you know, and he has such a good attitude about everything and he's very personable. He knows everyone's name. He, um, like truly knows everyone's name, which is so, so cool. And he like talks to you, he'll like sit down and talk to like background people and, um, he puts lavender oil in his beard. And so he just smells wonderful. Anytime he like walks by, you're like, oh, you can, you can, you can smell him before he gets there. You're like, oh, Ewan's coming. Ewan's coming. <laughs> but yeah, well, we that's had, an interesting fact. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all my scenes were, he was, you know, he, of course he is in a lot of scenes that I'm not in, but all my scenes were with him. So I, I got to hang out with him for about three months, um, you know, to just talk about family and kids, art and movies, his career. He had just finished Halston and I, he had just won, or he was nominated for the Emmy while we were shooting. And so that was like an exciting thing, like the day that he ended up winning it for Halston. So the day after, you know, like we all clapped for him and he took a big bow and yeah, he's just, he's very, very down to earth. Like he's the kind of guy you just want to go grab a drink with and have a meal and and smell his beard. And smell apparently. his beard. He's so dreamy. <laughs> How about Moses Ingram? Oh, I love Moses. Um, she, we have some mutual friends um, outside of the Star Wars universe. So mm -hmm. that was kind of fun um, to, I had never met her before, but I knew who she was through some of my mutual friends. And she's fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. She, um, she's a powerhouse. Um, I don't know if you saw her in the Queen's Gambit. I did. And I was watching him at the same time, watching that and Obi-Wan at this. And you know what? I didn't know it was the same person at first because yeah. I'm, I'm watching it and I, you know, I didn't know. I'm just like, okay, what's this? And then let's watch this. And, and all of a sudden it clicks like, wait a minute. Like she made some sort of facial expression. I'm like, I've seen that. And it was like, oh. yeah, yeah. She's, she's awesome. Um, yeah. She's so talented. It, it was the same because she was nominated uh, for an Emmy as well. Um, and so the day that she was nominated, the whole crew, um, they got her like a little cake and they like announced it to everyone. And she was like, had tears in her eyes. And, you know, you spend so much time with these people as you're filming, you're really on set for 12 to like 18 hours a day. And even some of the crew is there longer. Some of the PAs, they're the first to arrive and the last to leave. And, um, you spend so much time with these people that these like life victories, um, just really mean a lot and you celebrate them with like your set family. So when, when you're in this costume and, and you, you're not, you're not really speaking to the role. Right. And so it's, it's, it's very much a movement based um, costume. So how much of your time is spent like thinking like, okay, I, I am robbed right now of, you know, like so many like act my, of my actors tools and just being in this. And so, you know, what, how do you approach that? Just knowing, okay, this is totally movement based and it would probably, yeah, I, I got to say, if there is a person to give a movement based character, it's you uh, like that's, you. that's yeah. I, I mean, what, what is the thought process and approach that you would take with that? Ned B was really interesting. Um, I've done some other creature work mm -hmm. and you don't know until you see it. Um, how much it communicates. And so w during some of our screen tests, you know, I would do certain actions and then I would ask like, Hey, can I see that back afterwards? Um, just to kind of 
try to make a mental note that like, oh, if he needs to look surprised, he has to raise his shoulders this much, but too much. And it looks like he's afraid. And, you know, so to, to kind of note that, but the Ned B costume was so interesting in that re regard, because the less you move, the more impactful it is. Um, and there were times where like the, the director literally would say like, I'm talking millimeters right now. She's like, you're moving, like you're looking too far. And I'm like, I, I promise I'm just like moving like a centimeter. She's like, we need you to like move a millimeter. Mm. And it, you know, you're in that big costume and you think you would really have to overcompensate to like express something. But there was something about Ned B being so large that a really small movement really communicated more than I thought. Where conversely, I had done a, a film job after that and I would do a small movement and they're like, we, we can't see you doing anything. So I'd really have to overcompensate every movement. But with Ned, the smaller it seemed to be like, the more it communicated, which was really cool. That's one of those things like when, when you think about it, like um, it's, it's, or you might not think about like the costumers going into it, designing it that way. But like, you know, like all the thought that's got to be put um, when they're designing that costume to be able to wear. And then, and then like you were saying, all of your checks and, and things like that. And, uh, Actually, one of your friends uh, wrote in actually um, asked that question like Samantha Stevenson oh they nice. shouted out you like what's the you know what what is the process of uh, the costuming and wearing all that and I think I think we covered that and then we got another one I'll that, say one more thing about the, oh, yeah. the costume so Please. that the scripts are so secretive um, mm -hmm. they don't want anyone to know any plot point any new characters name so everything in the scripts are changed so like all the places all the names um, so when you get like I, I wouldn't even get a whole script. I would just get the scenes I was in and all the names would be changed. And I'd be like, who's Barbara? You know, and then I'd show up and they're like, oh, that's actually, you know, Darth Vader. You're like, oh, that makes more sense because, Bar <laughs> you know, but like you're reading the scripts and everything has a code name to it. Um, but even some of the fabrication departments, the people who are building the costumes don't get all the scripts, but they will get a list of what the costume has to do. Like he has to be able to kneel, he has to pick up a boulder, he has to carry you and McGregor, he has to yeah. hold a gun. And so they know by those things, like, okay, the hands have to be mobile enough to pick up a gun off the floor, um, but they don't get the scene. Um, so it's, it really is interesting. So Ned B had, I think, 20 things he had to be able to physically do. So as they were building the costume, they're like, hey, can you touch the ground? It's like, Nope. <laughs> and so they would have to redo things. So I was able to touch the floor or pick up a gun or different things like that. So it was a, it was an interesting process to try to, there's so many secrets to everything is top secret and kept in the vault. And you're definitely on a need to know basis only. I'm going to start doing that with my scripts. Change, change all the names. Change all the names. Yeah. That's, the villain is always Barbara. That's what I do. And when people, when, when if it's uh, not meeting a deadline or something like that, people are like, where's the script was supposed to be? And it's top secret. And you can't see it. Like I'm the producer. Shut up, Barbara. That's a bit. <laughs> um, we we got a question from a from a listener that says, uh, you know, when when they close a project, often they're very, you know, they're sad. They they got some some of the end of the project blues going on, and they want to know, did you did you get that with Ned B when you wrapped? It definitely was a labor of love um, and feeling just the, it, it's consuming. It consumes your day. It's like you are on set so long and these people really do become family. So when that ends, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely sad. I, I was very fortunate to have a project I was going to like the next week. I was flying to Canada to shoot another feature film. Um, so it was a really nice distraction. I think if I hadn't had another project lined up right away, it would have been like pretty depressing. And the other thing that's hard is you can't talk about it to anyone. You know, it's like you want to try to share and communicate what you're feeling and the ups and downs of, you know, just being, you know, any work experience and you can't talk about it to anyone. And so you feel very isolated. So it's so fun when it actually like a year later, it, you know, is announced it's coming out. And when fans start watching it and seeing it, even if they have like opinions and they don't like it, you can finally talk about it, you know, and um, it's just, it's so fun to finally be able to be excited publicly about something that you've had to like kind of sit on a secret for a while. I'm, I'm listening to you talk and all I can think about is lavender and Ewan McGregor's oh beard. It's, it <laughs> I was I'm going to try that. I wish we, we, could we should try that. Let's try it. Maybe lavender will sponsor us if we, if we do this. The plant? 
I don't know companies who, who manufacture oh. it, the, the, the fragrance. <laughs> Well, that may, we can try. <laughs> Please sponsor us, Lavender. So, what would you like? What would you have done? So, you got this project in Canada lined up for the following week. Um, what happens if suddenly Obi Wan falls behind in the filming? That was a very real. Um, I was very stressed for weeks um, because of that. The there was one day. So, uh, I, Obi was supposed to wrap on the twentieth, and I was supposed to fly out the twenty-first. They only gave me like one day and both, both productions knew what they were doing to the other production. Um, and so they kind of had to battle it out a little bit, ended up, both of them were about two weeks late. So we started the MGM film about two weeks late, but uh, Obi-Wan went over as well. But yeah, I was, I was nervous like every day, like as we were approaching the end date, cause I'm like, we're not, we're not making our scenes. We're not wrapping up and I'm going to be on an airplane and I'm actually the only person who fits in this costume. I, and not not that there aren't other people who are six foot eight, but like six foot eight, my weight exactly where like my it, hips. It was built for you specifically. Yeah, like the knee joint is where my knee joint is, and it could probably be fabricated to fit someone else, but it would not. It would take a little bit of time to do that. So and money and money. Yeah. So here's a here's a weird question, but um, I I think the answer may very well be yes. Did you because of like I said, it's developed specifically for you. You're in it all that time. You're creating it. Do you, did you get any type of an emotional attachment to that costume? It's so sweet. Well, yeah, I got bruises too. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely, yeah, definitely got emotional attachment, but it definitely was a love hate relationship, you know, like towards the end, you know, there'd be moments where, you know, they're about to like seal me in and put like lock in the head. And I was like, I just need a second. I just need a second. You know, like I, I have to prepare, just uh, um, give me a moment, you know, and I would take like a deep breath. I'm like, okay, put it on, you know, but it, it was a hard costume, but, um, yeah, I, I love that I'm Ned B, you know, it's a very special thing to get to like, I'm the only one who knows what it's like to be Ned B. And, you know, in the future, um, if Ned B comes back, um, they're, you know, they could p pick other people. I'm, I'm not guaranteed to be the character to, or the person to play Ned B. I mean, I would be really sad, you know, if mm -hmm. someone else, but we would definitely like bond and like share, like share trauma experience. But, um, I love that I got to be Ned B. Yeah. I was definitely like when it was over, it was like definitely bittersweet. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on and telling us about this. Um, before we let you go on, on this segment though, um, tell me, tell me about that headband. Oh, I'm wearing a floral headband. I got at a thrift store. Um, actually, I think everything I'm wearing has got a, at a thrift store. I love like wearing secondhand clothes, just finding you go with like $2 and you find a treasure. And I saw this headband. It's like a black background and it has like bright, like flowers and feathers and things like that. It's almost like a, a modern paisley looking. You that's actually a, could check it out on our Facebook. Yeah, we read a picture. That's a, that's a pretty fantastic headband. Though. Well, thank right you. There. So uh, now real quick, I got to ask, why is it? Why do you like? the thrift store shopping is it the bargains you can find there or you like, um, I don't know, finding somebody else's clothes that have a story in them or like, what, what about that? I think uh, several reasons, but yeah, I like the, you know, that everything is cheap. Um, like free is my favorite F word. Um, but <laughs> you know, I like things that are, I like things that are free or like inexpensive, but I also, um, I think that we have such a, a turnaround with like fast fashion these days. Um, and I just like the idea of like really wearing something and using it and yeah, you can find just like things that are loved. All right. I, I remember even when I was little, I'd go to school and I would never wear new clothes on the first day. Everyone else would be wearing their, you, it'd smell like Mervyn's when you walked into school because like everyone was wearing new clothes and I don't know. It's just, I like clothes that are lived in a little bit. It's the, I think the fabric is more comfortable once it's been washed a few times. All right, we got Ned B, the bargain shopper. The bargain shopper. Right, right in here. And also, a spoiler alert if you want to hear part two with Dustin and find out kind of where he started, where he's gone, and some other projects he's working on, check us out on part two with Dustin Sidehammer. So, thanks for listening, everybody, and we will catch you next time on.